Greeting Earthlings, if you follow the channel, you know that we love all things Apollo, and that during our last visit to Steve Gervetson's amazing space collection, we were given the opportunity to take two holy boxes of Apollo electronics to our lab. These are the boxes that brought you voice, data and live TV from the moon, and should be early masterpieces of microwave electronics, the blackest of black arts in analog electronics. After several months of work, our spacecraft transponder is now fully functional, but we are still struggling with the Earth side of the link, for which we are using original NASA ground test equipment. The NASA transmitter and receiver had apparently been modified for a subsequent mission and are no longer working on the Apollo frequency. We are currently waiting for some custom order quartz crystals to arrive and will then attempt the risky conversion and retuning back to the original Apollo system. In the meantime, the obvious alternative is to remake the Earth side equipment with modern electronics. There are several ways to do this and we already coaxed my ham receiver radio to do some of it. You can also just pile up modern keyside equipment and we will. But one of the most simple, cost effective and flexible way to do it is using modern digital SDR, which stands for Software Defined Radio. The SDR concept is very straightforward. Radio receiving or transmitting is nothing else than mathematical processing of very fast radio frequency signals. Frequency conversion, band filtering, modulation and demodulation, these are all mathematical signal computations which a radio does with electronic circuits. For example, here is phase modulation, which both our NASA transmitter and receiver are using. And here is FM modulation, which the Apollo transmitter uses for the live TV. Modulation is just a mathematical operation. So, if you think of it, a traditional radio system is simply one of the last standing analog computers. It just makes analog computations on radio signals really, really fast. And this last standing analog computer is on its way out, taken over by software defined radio. You need two technological ingredients to make a software defined radio. First, you need to be able to digitize your radio signal at speed. Maybe not straight at 2 GHz, although if you have enough money, you can, but you can do this in the hundreds of MHz within a reasonable expense. The second ingredient is mounds of computing power to throw at it, in order to do the wave calculations in real time. But nowadays, a good laptop can keep up with our relatively modest Apollo stack. And finally, we need to bring our 2 GHz microwave signal down to the manageable hundreds of MHz range that we can afford. This bit is still done using traditional radio techniques, using a mixer and a local oscillator to do a frequency difference operation. The very same technique that we have been using with our improvised ham receiver. And today, that analog microwave circuitry fits into a whiz-bang silicon chip. And voila, you have your SDR radio. In our case, this entry-level National Instrument SDR hardware does all we need for about $1,000. But there's a catch. Although all you need is to shell out the $1,000 for the hardware, the heavy lifting is transferred to the software. And heavy lifting it really is. In order to recreate a full Apollo ground station on SDR, we'd need the help of experienced SDR people. And right on cue, that's when we got contacted by Balin Sieber and Austin Epps. They had seen our videos and dropped us an email. They casually mentioned that they had done an entire S-band SDR stack to reconnect to a forgotten NASA satellite launched in the 1970s and that was coming back close to Earth. Then they simply connected their SDR hardware to the Arecibo antenna in 2014, successfully acquired and woke up the spacecraft, and executed commands to fire its thruster for a capture burn. They are local and willing to help us. What? What just happened? Say again? 
what is it you did? So let's take it step by step slowly. Here is NASA's ISEE-3 launched in 1978. It is actually the first satellite ever launched in an orbit around a Lagrangian point, like the Webb Space Telescope just did. It first surveyed the interaction of Earth's magnetic field with the solar wind. After its primary mission ended, NASA realized it would be a great tool for studying comet tails. A couple moon gravitational assists later, it was flung into solar orbit and flew in the tail of several comets, notably Comet Halley in 1986. Operations were eventually terminated in 1997 after an impressive 19 years of exploration. The satellite and its telemetry was shut down, leaving only an unmodulated carrier signal on to act as a tracking beacon. And then, 27 years later, in 2014, the satellite was coming back near Earth and it was realized that it may be possible to recapture it in Earth orbit. Of course, by then, the antiquated S-band transmission hardware, very similar to our Apollo system, had long been mothballed. It was out of the question for NASA to rebuild a new one. But that's when amateurs Balin Sieber and Austin Epps stepped up and proposed to do it on a very low budget using the then very new SDR technology. An agreement was struck with NASA, a crowdfunding campaign raised enough to support the project, and off to SDR programming they went. And a couple months later, here is the diminutive SDR radio with Balint on the entrance road to the giant Arecibo antenna. They had a bit of wiring to do to install an amplifier in the cupola, so they got a little trip to the heart of things. Oh, isn't it nice to see some S-band boxes up there. Back at the control station, they hooked up their miniature radios to the giant installations. Soon, they were able to see the signal from the spacecraft, very dimly at first, but eventually they got better at it and they had a strong signal, enough to see the spin of the satellite. Finally, it was time to send a magic command to reawaken the spacecraft transponder, having never tested it before. Oh yes, this definitely was worthy of a celebration dance. They had done what NASA could not do and got some modulated signal back, indicating the satellite had awakened and was sending telemetry back. At that point they unleashed the full power of their SDR approach and decoded the entire telemetry stream, matrix style, as if it was 1978 all over again. Hats off people, hats off. Hello guys, so we're back working our transponder, which is actually running right now. And back there we have some familiar faces. Show your face, Eric. And some new faces. Hello. We have... Hi, I'm Balin. I'm and Austin. And Balin and Austin are going to bring us to the modern age of SDR radio. Hopefully. Uh, which is something I wanted to do for a long while, but don't, we don't have the time nor expertise for it. And both of you have actually worked with real NASA satellites and have done this very thing, trying to redo an old receiver and transmitter for transponder that didn't exist anymore. That's right. We had to recreate some old NASA motors. Right. ICE 3 reboot project 2014. And that was successful, right? You were able to re recover the connection with how old was the spacecraft? I think it was launched in 1978, so pretty old. And all of the previous uh, equipment that had been used to communicate with the space probe had gone no, missing. No longer existed. No longer yeah. existed. So we had the challenge of doing some, um, with our colleagues at the time, some techno-archaeology to look through the old documentation understand uh, the 
air interface to the to the space probe and then recreate it with uh, modern technology, which really nowadays just boils down to a a software defined radio like like what you see here. So we we headed to our Arecibo armed with a laptop and a, a USRP here. A couple of SDRs, yeah. Um, connected the RF into their big amazing patch panel and we were able to send commands to the space probe to bring it out of its its slumber, re enable telemetry, um, receive telemetry from the from the probe. And, and it was also S band, right? S band, yeah. same ratio, 240 on 221, uh, turn around, oh. same, same GPL basic principle, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. We and and for people that ask, you know, how, how much does it take to reproduce all that hardware with modern equipment? Well, the answer is there. The hope here is that we can get the SDR radio to talk to our, and be received by our uh, transponder and vice versa. That's the hope, yeah. So we've just got the, these software-defined radios connected to our um, laptop here. We're running GNU radio as it gives us a very convenient um, interface, in this case graphical user interface with GRC to prototype some simple uh, signal flows here. And <coughs> we're going to attempt to transmit um, a, a phase modulated uh, tone on the S-band uplink to the transponder will produce some more more complex flow graphs like, like this for example and actually these are the old ones. That's the configuration you use for your your NASA satellite. Yeah that's right this is actually the, the telemetry um, demodulator yeah so not actually terribly complicated because the, the signal well, is still pretty for you pretty straightforward for me. Um, but there's some, you know, receivers tend to be a little, little more interesting than, than transmitters. So there's some clock recovery and, and the PLL to track the carrier and, and extraction of the. Um, okay, I think we got the ro the right man on the job here. I just want to tweak the setting of my um, spectrum analyzer. Yeah. Out of the yeah. So now we have we have left the comfort of hardware, and we are all in software. So you need to compile your flow graph? Oh no, it's works? just a little slow in, in starting up as well. Alright. So you're receiving? Me? So this is, yeah, this is receiving. So um, I do it this way, and he does it with this, and that. And here you go. Yeah. Can I, can I turn it off and see if it's really... Oh, it's so small, I have a hard time to capture it. It's there. And it's something. Yeah, it looks like... Um, this might be our, our downlink. Okay, well, I, I'm going to turn it off. And PM off. Yep, it's gone. I'm gone. I'm back. Whoa. Whoop. Oh, then you, you, you saw all these little spurs. Is it? Oh, did you see that? Is it was yeah. Oh, it's it yes. really hopping around. So, yes, because at first it starts in a locked state and the VCO drifts around and then it is a. Oh, nothing to lock on and then it went to uh, we should redo it it it, it went to uh, the, the ox oscillator free running so if I turn it off again okay off and then you will see it coming back on the VCO then all of a sudden release the VCO and go in the ox oscillator whoop VCO up ox oscillator that VCO is all over the place yeah, these are actually pretty cool steps. Yeah. And interestingly here, um, the the noise floor comes up quite a bit. Oh, because I'm in ranging? Let me take ranging off. Okay. Go. Yeah, look at that, see? Yeah, because... Now those, those yeah, we can see the, the spurs there, but they're pretty low down. So if you turn ranging back on, it's just going to yeah, turn around. Yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm turning back, I'm, I'm ranging noise back, which means yeah. you're really receiving me pretty well. Yeah. Okay. So, good first step, the SDR radio can see our return Apollo signal. But we don't have a link yet. For that, the SDR first has to transmit an uplink at 2.1064 GHz, on which our receiver will lock. Then turn it around on the way down on 2.2875 GHz, along with the ranging signal. Right now, I am just returning ranging noise. 
let's try this again. So ready to transmit? I'm gonna change the um, the wire for it. Red LED. There All we go. right. Uh, I don't. Ah, I see. I think you might be somewhere. Let me turn ranging on. No, I don't see you. That's okay because it should. You know, everything's turned out. Okay. Uh, do, you want, do you want to check the uplink? Yeah, let's, let me check the uplink at 2.1. Oh, it would help if I said it. Uh, I, it don't I don't see you. I, 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 I took it down from that to bring it back. I see you. Oh, something happened there. I see something happening. Oh, 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 I don't see you here, but I probably. Let, let me go back to. Yeah, I see you. Here you are. So you see me over there. Yeah, so I'm, you're beating with my VCO. So now go down in frequency. I haven't added the frequency slider yet. So, so I can add that now. Good second step here. I can now receive the SDR uplink, but I have not locked on it yet. For that, Balin still needs to program in the ability to sweep the uplink frequency. He will then sweep until his frequency falls within our locking range. The exact frequency at which this will happen varies. Because of the Doppler effect, it depends on the speed at which the spacecraft is traveling. The sweep and lock procedure was called acquisition and had to be performed every time the link had to be re-established. For example, each time the spacecraft reappeared from behind the moon. A few moments later. So you have, oh. you have added sweep? Yeah. We've added an additional pair of sliders in here to do the fine frequency control of the uplink. Sweep your transmit frequency. You are going to try to acquire us from a honeysuckle or yeah. from gold, goldstone. Oh, you are getting closer. You are getting closer. Locked. Locked. Okay, so we have the SDR talking to our Apollo transponder. So now, so that's as far as we had gotten with our HP equipment, but now you have this huge advantage on us that you can you, know, you can put data on it. PM tones, telemetry, whatever, just the programming's the limit there. Hey, anything we fancy. Okay, but it's working. I think we have the new connected to the old and now we can do all kind of experiment, particular PM. Do you want to do a tone? I could generate the subcarrier and, and FM modulate it and then put it in the PM input and then you can demodulate it. So we could do voice with all the equipment we have here. Uh, so that would be voice from the moon to your stuff. Okay, now we are getting to the juicy part. We are going to transmit some voice for the first time. However, this gets a bit complicated, since the link had to transmit voice, data and ranging at the same time, voice was not transmitted directly. Instead, voice was modulated on a subcarrier, which in turn modulated the main carrier. A subcarrier is in a sense a radio within a radio. But to explain this properly, we need to bring back the elevator music. So far, we have just completed our basic link. We received the uplink from the SDR at 2.1064 GHz. We then locked onto it, translated the frequency by a factor of 240 over 221, and that gave us the downlink carrier that we sent back to Earth at 2.2875 GHz. Now we want to add voice, and for that, we are going to need a subcarrier at 1.25 MHz. We are then going to modulate the voice onto that subcarrier using FM modulation. That will give us a modulated carrier centered on 1.25 MHz that looks something like this on the spectrum analyzer. Next, we take that signal and use phase modulation this time to modulate our downlink carrier. That will generate our modulated carrier, which on the spectrum analyzer will have these very characteristic subcarrier sidebands, 1.25 MHz on either side of the carrier. And then we finally send the whole thing back down to Earth. 
To receive it at the other end, you have to peel the onion to recover the subcarrier by phase demodulation and then the voice by FM demodulation. And that's the beauty of SDR, no complicated demodulation circuit to build, we can just program it in. That is, Balint can. And you can continue to add subcarriers as much as you desire, and by the time you are done, counting the ranging, the various forms of data, biomedical information, recorded tape data, retransmitted LEM and EVA, television, and so on and so forth, the final spectra get to be quite complicated. But for now, let's just see if we can do voice. So while Balland is trying to make a PM receiver here, I am going to modulate the transponder. So this is the input to the transponder back there. And we are transmitting. This is the, the uh, carrier at 1.5 megahertz. And if we zoomed on it, it's FM modulated. And, and I hear something. You have it. I heard a little bit of it. Yeah, it's it's there, but um, yeah. I like the Python just quit. Okay. That, that's something. <laughs> it's a different world. Your bugs are a different nature. <laughs> yes. So if your receiver doesn't work, you just recompile it, right? Aha. Uh -huh. And it's got it. And we should hear the tone. Kind of faint. Okay. Okay. But we can do better. Astronaut get into position. All right. There so now I have my little my the microphone comes here and I'm going to use the FM in and I'm going to frequency modulate my subcarrier using external. All right. See, see, see something. I'm sorry, Dave, but I'm afraid I can't do that. <laughs> I think we heard you. Oh, it's, it's the, there's some feedback. Do it again. I'm sorry, Dave, but I'm afraid I can't do that. Yeah, so we have... Uh, Open the pod bay doors, Hal. <laughs> we have transmission from the moon. Okay, voice transmission correctly done on subcarriers. We had done tool on basement, but now... We are on subcarrier, so the idea that we can use the SDR and get the data and all that stuff, and we can try it first like this before we try it with the real hardware. All right, voice from the moon on the subcarrier. <laughs> well, thanks, thanks, guys. Thank you. So Thank you. Uh, I think we'll. Look We'll go back uh, in our dens and uh, uh, you guys are tasked to work on figuring out how they did the data. We, we, haven't, we have looked at yeah. the up data, but not the down data. It's frames quite complicated. Yeah. And see if we can uh, revive that data link before we have the hardware working. Re reuse a bit of our old... Uh, yeah, you've done it before. Right? Should be fine. Cool. Looking forward to it.